All right, so let's kick off this event with the very first topic, and that is aftermarket and next generation mobility. And as I mentioned, I have Holger with me for the next three days, and also, of course, now. And um, Holger, what can we expect from this very first topic? Yeah, we are starting with a very exciting topic. We are talking about the future, the future of our automotive industry, so next generation mobility. And we are talking about what this means for our customers, for the aftermarket, and um, how we can help as ZF Aftermarket, how we can help in this transformation of the industry. Um, so I'm expecting quite an interesting discussion now. Oh, and I'm really looking forward to it. And speaking of interesting discussion, we have brilliant guests here today. And first of all, let's go all the way to Shanghai because there we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Holger Klein. He is with us. He's the member of the board of management at ZF Group. So, Holger, wonderful having you with us. Good morning to Hannover. <laughs> and then also we have Philippe Colpron. He is global head of ZF's aftermarket division. Wonderful having you too. Happy to you. And another exciting guest is Markus Wittig, Head of Business Line Passenger Car Aftermarket. Good morning. Good morning to you. And we've got Marco Neubold, Global Head of Business Line Industrial Aftermarket and New Mobility. And last but definitely not least in this topic, <laughs> we've got Dr. Hans-Peter Klebinder, and you are the expert for sustainable future mobility at University of St. Gallen. So it really is exciting to have all of you together here and we're looking forward to a fantastic discussion about this really hot and very interesting topic. So Philippe, let's start off with you. Um, you I think in January you just took the lead at ZF Aftermarket. Um, how do you see the role of ZF Aftermarket in regards to the future of mobility? Well, I'm very happy to, uh, to have this opportunity. There's so many transformations. We all know that there's technology uh, advancement on the vehicles, which is going to bring a lot of changes, but also the aftermarket is going through complete transformation. And we could say that the complete mobility and transportation ecosystem uh, is going through a transformation. So um, I think ZF plays an important role through all of the pillars uh, to accompany the industry and our partners towards that journey. Um, we talk about connected vehicles and what it will mean to uh, all of the, the software and the intelligence that we can bring in the ecosystem. Uh, autonomous and shared, uh, we will speak in the next hours about, for example, our autonomous shuttle and uh, how, for example, in the aftermarket, we need to be embedded in those projects from the beginning. And uh, electrification, sustainability, where ZF plays a definitive role in uh, accompanying the industry and being a one-stop shop as well of solutions going forward. So um, within ZF Aftermarket, it's important that we realize those changes, that we embrace them, uh, but it cannot be an afterthought. The aftermarket cannot just happen naturally after. We need to anticipate this and it needs to be uh, a full part because we are integrated through uh, all of those pillars of changes. So we need to be at the forefront of this transformation. So, Holger, I think that is really a big point, right? What uh, Philippe just said about being on the forefront. It's not just a big point. It is also a, a, a real big challenge. Yeah? And uh, it's starting now, so we are talking about the future, but it's actually happening right now. So we are prepared to help our customers with that. Um, and also, we are, of course, also prepared from the um, OE innovation side. So what is, how does the next generation of vehicles look like? Um, uh, this is also important and you need to understand this, you need to have the know-how and then transfer it um, to the workshop, to the technician, so that we are still able to repair the vehicles of the future. All right, and speaking of new technologies and also all these developments, um, Holger, I would also have a question to you, to Shanghai, because basically I would be very interested in regards to this, um, what is the strategy at ZF actually in regards to the next generation of mobility? <laughs> Ravina, that's a broad question, but let me try to be brief in, in answering it. And uh, let me start with, um, I'm just coming back from actually two months um, in Europe, seeing partners and customers, now being back in Shanghai. And you see how differently the world is developing. Why in Europe, everybody was talking about the Green Deal and new uh, regulation coming up in terms of sustainability. Here in Shanghai, probably we are more dealing with uh, the outcome of megacities uh, being 
in total congestion and uh, you have some air pollution, which is very concerning. Yeah? So uh, we as the app answering your question, we are very broad in our portfolio. That's important to understand. Yeah? So we are covering, so to say, the industry from commercial vehicles to pest cars, to agricultural equipment, construction, off highway, up to marines, uh, to marine uh, applications like boats. So very broad portfolio in terms of where uh, propulsion systems, mobility systems are required. And then, of course, we are in the energy generation industry as well with our windmill business. Yeah, we are uh, with 25% overall market share, global market share in transmissions for windmills and power generators. So this is a pretty important topic for us as well, how to generate green energy. Yeah, so when we now look at the market, we look at really the future of mobility and not just components. Yeah? And of course, the service is playing a very, very important role. If you think about reman, if you think about uh, uptime guaranteeing service in different mobility concepts, and we might come to that later, uh, but it's not a surprise that we are on the one hand side at the forefront of technology, see, think, act, uh, while we are covering everything you need for autonomous driving in terms of sensor technology. We just introduced here at Auto Shanghai a couple of months ago, one of the fastest supercomputers automotive, automotive graded to do with the thinking, yeah, high performance in, in computing. And we are very much transforming into a software company. So, and then the classical business with braking, brake pads, steering, and e-mobility, which is changing our industry quite significantly. And all of this, of course, needs to be supported by our aftermarket, but the aftermarket is way more than just now um, pushing boxes and selling spare parts, but it's getting more and more connected with our customers. And of course, we are going and entering new areas of mobility. So for example, uh, we are very active with a company called To Get There, which is offering mobility as a service yeah, in uh, autonomously driving shuttles. And actually we are doing this since 1999 you know, on Sentosa Island in Singapore, where we have those fully autonomously driving people movers. And this is taking shape here in Asia, but as well in Rotterdam, in a business park where we are having, for example, those people movers. So we are covering a pretty broad scope, and we believe that's an advantage because we can cross leverage technologies and experiences, and we try to be at the forefront of shaping the future of mobility. And now next to the Automechanica, of course, another very important fair is the IAA, which just uh, closed in Munich. Um, what would you say from your point of view were the, the top OE innovations and also what do they mean for the aftermarket, Holger? I mean, one thing is certainly the push to um, electric mobility. And I mean, this is very, very clear. We are all going to uh, battery electric vehicles and in the commercial vehicle area, we might talk about fuel cells. Yeah, so um, the, this is a very important shift, but I wouldn't say that this is the most radical one. Of course, it will impact our um, uh, aftermarket business in terms of services, high voltage, et cetera, et cetera. I think the more radical revolution is taking place in terms of connectivity and what is happening there and how is that changing business models and of course in terms of automated driving and i'm not necessarily talking about fully autonomous but uh, about uh, the different level of assisted driving which are already making a big difference to our industry and you see that this is driving the innovations in future car models as well in the past car as in the commercial vehicles. So uh, I would think those are the, the big things. Software, if you want software-defined cars. Right. 
Definitely very interesting. And also when we talk about the future of aftermarket, it's important to talk about the future of mobility. And Hans-Peter, I mean, that's your field, definitely. To be honest, I mean, we've got a car here from the Mahindra from Formula yep. E. And um, obviously everyone's talking about e-mobility. That's a big part there when you talk about the future. But a lot of people are also hesitant regarding that. I mean, not, oh, not everyone is driving an um, a e-car yet. So what's your point of view there? That the transmission is just one point of the whole part. Like Holger mentioned, it's a broader picture. And I think the argument about which energy source we use, it's over. The tipping point is there. We need different transmission to our now, and we will have different solutions. I think the main thing is that what's different from today is that uh, the need and the speed for transformation is accelerating dramatically in every year. So uh, there's a not need for transformation, I would even say revolution. We have three main points. The one is the trend sustainability, which accelerated the last two years. And the climate goals will be the overarching theme, which really uh, gives us a framework and uh, shows us where to go. The second one is uh, urbanization. Holger mentioned it. We have mega cities worldwide. We have big problems to solve. On the other side, through Corona, we are beginning to think how can we adapt our cities to a more sustainable, more greener, yeah, more fun lifestyle. And there's a big movement in Shanghai, Singapore, but also in Europe taking place, like Paris, the 50-minute city. So the second one is urbanization. The third one is digitalization. And we now realize without data, all this won't happen. So everybody and everything also will be connected. Who will be not connected will be not existent. And I think we need this innovation, this new technology, to make mobility more sustainable and also to provide it to everybody, not to exclude anybody. But really looking into the glass ball, yeah. in 30 years, what do you think will mobility look like? It will be more fun like today. We will enjoy it more. We will have more variety. We as customers will be king. So we can choose from different alternatives from move from A to B. We will have this one app which knows us and which knows our patterns, our preferences. And it will really help us to move from A to B with four wheels, with two wheels, with one wheel, maybe with no wheel. Micromobility is going to play a major role in our cities. So I really think it's a fascinating future and I think uh, much more fun and fascinating as today. Fun and fascinating. But Holger, quite frankly, are we ready for this future? <laughs> Who would dare to say we are ready? Yeah, so I think we are all trying hard. And I tell you, I'm very humble. Yeah, I mean, you, you know the app, we are more than 100 years in this industry. But as Hans Peter said, this change is happening now so fast that I would say we, we, we dared to do a strategy 2025, like six years ago. And the only thing which was wrong, it all happened 2019. Yeah, so are you yeah. ready? I uh, I am doubtful to, to say yes, absolutely. But I think we are moving fast, we are transforming fast, and we are not on our own. Yeah, I think one important aspect is we are doing it with an ecosystem. We are doing it with partners. And um, I think coming together as partners, we are getting ready and we are trying to keep the pace of the change. Yeah. Absolutely. And Holger, I mean, the pace is really quick. Yeah. And I, mu I must say, Hans-Peter, you painted quite a mixed picture, right? So, so you are saying um, this is kind of dangerous for everyone in the industry because you're saying who's not disruptive. Yeah. It's disruptive. Yeah, who's not connecting yeah. will not exist. So kind of dangerous. You're also saying it's coming faster and faster. So with the EU program Fit for um, 55, uh, we'll see that there will be no combustion engine cars anymore allowed on European yeah. streets. So, and then you're also drawing a, a nice picture. Yes, yeah, saying like it's going to be fun. It's going to be um, uh, easy with that app and etc. So uh, what does it take? So I think we need to discuss, um, uh, also looking a little bit uh, to Philippe, yeah? I think we need to discuss that we are now ready to help our customers. We need to start now to act. A workshop needs to connect. A workshop needs to become digital. Um, and of course, a, a single um, uh, uh, family-owned workshop 
cannot do that on its own. So I think this is why we are there and why we are helping in that kind of transformation and to make sure that our customers are, are on that happy side of your picture. But that's a point really, Holger, I'd like to pick up on with Philippe because you did mention, is it not maybe also a bit dangerous? And Philippe, this question is to you. What do you think? Is this uh, a bit dangerous in regards to the future of mobility when you're looking at the customers, at the fleets, the workshops and the distributors? Well, like every transformation, there are risks and opportunities. It's important to be aware of both so we can anticipate the risk and we can go for the opportunities. Uh, the value chain of having to ensure uptime of mobility, ensuring that there is installation, repair, service, that there is a very effective logistic system, that it's a business of proximity globally around the world. You could say that all those elements probably need to continue. They're essential for the uptime of the vehicles. However, in each of them, there, there is its own transformation. Uh, every one of them uh, will have either consolidation impact or digitalization impact. Uh, so how can we help our partners to go through that transformation? I believe that um, we need to realize that yes, future is moving fast, but there's a long tail of the legacy of the activities as well. And we need to have the right balance in between the two. In particular, thinking of a global environment where every region is moving at its own speed in its own specificities. So, the, like Holger was saying, I think the importance is how can we leverage the ecosystem? How can we use uh, our scale, our knowledge of the different industries to help our partners dialogue and make sure that the industry uh, is ready and moving towards the opportunities? Absolutely. And Marcos, um, all of these changes, what do they mean for the automotive uh, aftermarket? And also, should players brace for impact, would you say? Well, if you look to the automotive aftermarket, you know, we have seen changes before. You know, the change of technology in the vehicle, uh, the complexity to repair a car. And we showed that we were able to adapt. But we heard earlier, of course, the speed is different. And of course, the scale is different. But look, the average lifespan of a vehicle is 15 years. So workshops have jobs to do today, but they need to adjust. On another hand, everything what moves, no matter if it's one wheel, two wheels, four wheels, needs service. But we heard also earlier, they can't do it alone. So we as an industry, the manufacturer, the wholesaler, and the workshop together need to shape, because also in change, there is opportunity. Opportunity is always that what we need to embrace, that's for sure. And uh, Marco, when you hear all about uh, these, this constant change of technologies, really, um, what can the workshop partners really do to actually help there and to really keep up with this constant change? Well, Verena, honestly, I believe the only chance to stay on top of new technology is constant learning. Yeah. And our service staff and our partners are in the unique position that they do have access to the latest state-of-the-art technology and to a lot of OE know-how, which we can provide. Yeah. In addition to that, they can rely on our global service network, which is on each continent in a lot of countries, always close to the customer, where we also support and help. And last but not least, we do provide expert know-how on very complex systems in the aftermarket, for example, the transmission. And uh, let me just explain what I mean with an example. So um, the two of us do not really need to know that an 8 HP80 automated transmission consists of 1,056 single pieces, wow. but our product experts for sure know. <laughs> I'm sure they have to, <laughs> definitely. <want> <laughs> when you hear about autonom autonomous um, future, obviously that's something you hear about all the time, you read about it. It's t obviously a big, big topic. topic. Um, but what would you say does it look like concretely? Well, Verena, this is honestly a very deep question. Let me try to frame it a little bit like we see the future currently. Um, so we expect a very fast increase of ATS, of autonomous transportation systems. Um, there is a current Deloitte study that predicts 740,000 of those vehicles, autonomous transportation systems, also called shuttles, also called driverless cars. So it's 740,000 just on Germany's streets in 2035. Yeah, so there might be a huge change in the vehicle park. The good news, as Holger in Shanghai said it at the beginning, the good news is we know how to service such systems since the late 1990s. And of course, this is also our focus currently. So we are working uh, on increasing those capabilities and also bring it to our partners. 
in regards to ATS. Hans-Peter, how do you see it? Big topic. Uh, I think air mobility and ATS are the two biggest disruptive uh, trends. And I think for us it's a very emotional thing because we love our steering wheel and we don't want to keep give it away. Gives you safety, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> and I think what we went through with electric, which now begins to normalize, let's say, discussion, we will the same have with uh, autonomous driving because it puts us really in our heart and guts because uh, we don't want to give away control. But the obvious advantages, you know, for safety, for sustainability for everything, there is, I think it's one of the biggest drivers for our future, also for future sustainable mobility, to have ATS. All right, and speaking of ATS, we've got another expert here, um, Kim Oliver Kohlmeier. We're excited to have you here too, Kim, because we're talking about ATS, and obviously you brought us a little uh, scale model here of a shuttle. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Verena. So the, we have the great opportunity in ZF that we have the future already in a nutshell available today. So that's our shuttle, our I would say our part of the autonomous transport system we are already operating today. And um, this is really everything what the workshop can expect in the future. So we are talking about the AD system with all the sensors, the radar, the LiDAR. We're having the supercomputer as the brain of the system and we're having the, it's highly connected. So all data is available. We need it for the fleet management. There's no driver inside. Someone has to supervise it. So that's really what we can provide already today and what we can see. It's a window in the future now. Speaking of winner in the future, um, I think it's a very exciting topic as well. And we have a little film that I'd love to uh, show you now because it kind of gives you an impression of this. So let's watch the film now, Kim, all right? wonderful seeing something like that in motion, in action, and obviously it is a big part. But then again, in regards to um, ZF, obviously ZF is focusing on service and infrastructure. And in regards to the workshops, I guess, they don't have the know-how yet to service the ATS, right? So um, how does that look in the future? Like um, this shift in service, what does that mean for the future of these workshops? Yeah, I just explained what uh, kind of exciting technology is inside this shuttle. And, and we ensure through our after market network to our trainings, to our logistics, that our workshops, our customers are having the right technology available, the right know-how available, and at the end, we are, on, we, are, we are using our global network here to serve these systems. And then a question regarding uh, the services of ZF Aftermarket. Um, what exactly does ZF Aftermarket offer in this area? Yeah, as explained, so we are providing the parts on the one side, we are providing the know-how, um, and we are providing, I would say, everything our workshop will need in future. And at the end, it's also an electric vehicle, so we make sure that they have the right qualification. So all in all, I mean, this really is a very exciting yeah. topic, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm absolutely thrilled about the technology, <laughs> and, and um, I think we have a great, great opportunity to really start the future now with this.
All right. So, Kim, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. And by the way, uh, to all of you watching, obviously we have very strict regulations here in regards to the epidemic. That's why we're all standing here apart from each other. And also we've been tested. I just wanted to add that before we continue with um, our discussion here. Because, Philippe, important also in regards um, from an, from an aftermarket point of view, um, when we meet here again in the Automechanica in 2030, yeah, let's have a glimpse into the future. Um, who do you think will stand here? And also, um, who do you think will also have entered the market by then? I know it's always difficult, but let's have a look into the future. Well, first of all, who will be there? I, I, I would start by saying us, ZF. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's us. <laughs> um, we, are, we already see new type of players uh, into the different shows. I think we, we've seen the emergence of e-commerce players, for example, or uh, a growth in the amount of software companies, for example, in the field of uh, fleet management, which already attend those, uh, those fairs. So probably that trend in terms of digitalization and software as a service will continue. Um, consolidation of different segments of the industry will also happen. What is important for us is to really be there for our customers. We want to go through this journey uh, with the industry, with our customers, making sure that we can provide our know-how, helping them connecting the dots so they are ready and they can be strong uh, when we meet again 10 years down the road. Is that how you see it also, Holger? Yeah, and uh, I think we, we all don't have that Chrysler ball, right? Uh, yeah. So I, I wish we had. And I'm, I'm with Philippe. Hopefully, we are still standing here with you, Verena, of course, <laughs> and uh, moderating then another Auto Mechanica and having customers and maybe be able to fly again so that our customers and also Holger can join us again um, uh, for a real Auto Mechanica. And I think what's, what's coming really across is yes, we are having a little glimpse in the future. Yeah, we saw the the vehicles, the autonomous shuttles, and uh, uh, we talked about all these kind of future technologies that are now coming to the market. And, um, and uh, Marco, I think you had a really good point to say it's all about learning. And actually, the next three days, starting today, they are about learning. So you can learn a lot, I think, by listening um, also to the next sessions. And uh, you can also click and um, have some product deep dives on our website. And uh, finally, there are also live trainings. Um, so on Thursday, um, our customers will have live trainings, again, in all kinds of different languages. So if you want, you can easily click um, and join a training. You will even get a free certificate um, uh, to do so. So the future is here. Um, and um, we have a little bit of an outlook, but it, I, I think it's still super uncertain. And um, let's roll back the tape maybe in, in, in 2030 and see if, uh, how we looked like 10 years ago <laughs> and uh, 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 if you're still around. Yeah, that'd be very interesting to see. And Holger, also a question to you, especially in your role. Um, obviously, it's a very challenging time, but as we heard so many times, it's also time to grab the opportunities. So would you say, are you thankful for this time, even though it's challenging? Absolutely, and I mean, part of being successful is probably not being scared of the future. We are always say, hey, you need to be paranoid in terms of anticipating the future. But then if you are fast enough, you might shape it. Yeah, And I believe we are all very, very excited about being in a position size-wise, knowledge-wise, perhaps even then resource-wise, to be one of the shapers, hopefully, of those trends. And therefore, I am really inspired and um, fired up to, to be part of this change. Oh, we're fired up too, that's for sure, especially for what is to come the next three days. Um, Holger, question to you. We're talking about the future of mobility. It's one thing to talk about it, but can I ask you privately, what is your part in the future of mobility? What are you doing, perhaps in regards to an e-car, or what are you doing? So I don't have an electric car yet. Actually, I don't have a car at the moment at all. <laughs> um, so I use the uh, I use the pandemic to kind of say, yeah, I'm in home office. So why do I need a car? Um, so I changed my kind of mobility behavior a bit. But uh, now I'm actually in the phase because we all know this is going to end, right? And hopefully, hopefully, soon. hopefully, it's going to end. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm now in that pleasure situation of, of uh, clicking through the configurators on the websites. Like, I'm still not decided yet, 
But what I know now is it's going to be 100% so fully electric um, vehicle. But you know, with the range and like um, with the currently available models, it's still a challenge to choose the right one. Right? Absolutely. But obviously, as a journalist, I'm allowed to be curious. So, Philippe, what about you? Well, uh, we do have a fully electric car at home, which usually my, my wife drives uh, during the week. I do have a plug-in hybrid for the flexibility of the long distances. Okay. Marcos, what about you? I'm so curious. I'm sorry, but we got to find out. I'm an aftermarket guy. I'm still the diesel guy, so because most of my time I drive long distance. But I have to say, in my, my spare time, I ride mountain bike without a motor to keep fit. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Marco? Well, I would love to say that I came with one of those shuttles, but that's obviously not yet the case, but we are working on it. So privately, we have a, a battery electric car at home since one and a half years. And uh, I also drive a plug-in hybrid as a company car. And uh, I had the first 6,000 kilometers driven fully electric, including a vacation trip to northern Italy. So I can, I can share a little bit of experience also how good or bad the uh, charging infrastructure already is uh, when it comes to driving larger distances. All right, before we come to you, Hans-Peter, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Holger, we don't want to forget you in, Chi in uh, Shanghai. So what about you? <laughs> So basically two kinds of uh, mobility concepts. You know, the one is um, my firm car, which is managed by a fleet. It's a van and it's equipped like a mobile office, which is basically due to the fact that if you are trying to manage Shanghai traffic, you as an average for nine kilometers, you need uh, three quarters of an hour. Yeah, so it's a total waste of time if you drive yourself. So that's why I'm in the privileged position having a driver and using the fleet car as a mobile office. Uh, privately, my favorite is my e-scooter. Typically, I'm on the side lane and taking over all these other cars because I'm way faster. <laughs> Absolutely, I bet. That's very smart. And now, Hans-Peter, uh, obviously, I'm very curious to find out your answer. What is it? I'm a mobility chunky freak. So I, I, as a family car, we have a Volkswagen Bulli with VLAN. And I try to use it as much as po possible with blah blah car. Second one is my Mini. So everybody likes to drive it, but it's, it's my own one. It's a combustion, combustion car, very fast. And I, I am the privilege to be a test driver of the Microlino. We're going to talk about it later. And uh, Holger, I drive a Yadea. You know it. So I'm also test driving a Yadea scooter. I have a Microlino e-scooter, affordable. So really, everything that's out there. And I also have my big love is a 1962 Vespa Piaggio. Mm -hmm. So still taking some of the very old fascination to today. I love the but Vespa too. I really love to be flexible. Mm -hmm. I'm telling the train with everything just to really see is it working. Not just to talk about it, but also walk my talk. All right. By the way, in the epidemic, I discovered a bike. I know how to ride a bike since I was a kid, but actually I bought one and now I'm, I'm getting more sporty. So is, it, is, is it an e-bike? No, or of course not. It's actually you. me trying to stay fit. And Hans-Peter, another question yeah. to you. The role of the suppliers in this transmission to yeah. mobility, how do you see that? It was great for me at the CS uh, Las Vegas two years ago. Suddenly there was a car nobody expected. It was presented by Zoni. And it was done with great partners worldwide. One of them, I guess, were you. And so I think that the future, I'm asked this question a lot. I think our OEMs have really will have a tough time because it's all about customer obsession orientation. The more dig digitalization, the more customer orientation. It puts us and your customers in the driver's seat and that's a big, big challenge. And so I think the new players we're talking about, Huawei, Apple, Sony, they will play a role and they need strong partners. And I see the partners in Germany, Austria, because we have a big heritage. We have the best talent, the best skills, the best universities. And uh, we know how to scale up. And so I guess that uh, it's going to be a totally new game with new players. And I guess that the suppliers, they could be the winners of the revolution. You know, we have Drexelmeyer, Bosch, Conti, all of them around us. And they are a little bit in the shadow. And I think this will change dramatically. And so uh, I see it right, and I feel a good energy here, great team. Uh, Holger, it's good that you sit in Shanghai, that's a hot spot where a future happens. My thing was um, before Corona, I spent at least two times a year in Shanghai and Shenzhen. So I think you're a global player, and yeah, it's a good chance to really be on the winning part of this big disruptive transformation. 
And um, Holger, in regards to ZF's contribution towards the next generation, uh, do you have a clean conscience there? Are you excited about it? Are you happy with it? Do you sleep well at night? <laughs> yes, so far, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, we uh, you know, our, our mission, so to say, is uh, clean and safe mobility. And we are bringing our contribution in terms of active and passive safety systems. And I think, like Hans Peter described, we have way too many crashes, mortalities, and traffic still. Yeah. So that's something we need to solve. And the other one is sustainability. Yeah. And honestly, the aftermarket is becoming a major, or is developing a major role in this. You know, because these assets we are driving. They consume a lot of energy in being produced. And now it's a no-brainer that if you want to be more sustainable, you need reuse, you need manufacturing, you need service guaranteeing uptime. And green will only happen if we have a very performant-oriented um, service and aftermarket uh, infrastructure. So I think this is something where we, as a company, with our partners and with our customers can can have a huge contribution and therefore i think as a purpose-driven uh, uh, individual i'm convinced that we are playing a very very important role and you might know that zf is striving for climate neutrality by 2040 yeah. globally that's a major step but i believe that's something we all need to do yeah and therefore very positive and yes i still sleep well at night <laughs> That's what I thought, and we're very glad to hear that. Holger, um, as Holger just mentioned, 2040, I mean, that's around the corner, and that really is a big step. Yes, it, it's, it's around the corner. It's, it's going to be a big step to be uh, climate neutral, uh, definitely, definitely. And we will have a full session on that as well, also today. Um, and uh, tomorrow we'll also talk about how we're going to make uh, the commercial vehicles aftermarket green and sustainable together. And... Uh, uh, Together in motion, yeah, um, and I think we didn't talk about that yet, but uh, probably you have seen, um, is our new claim. Um, and what I'm taking from the discussion, and I think you can feel it, Verena, that we are really passionate about the future. Um, we are really passionate about the future. We are seeing that big transformation coming. Um, and we want to express that we are together with our customers, with our trusted partners in that journey. So it's a journey. It's not a standstill. Um, it's going to be a big change, and as Hans-Peter, you said it clearly, it's going to happen fast. Um, I think we are prepared now. It's, it's, uh, we are ready now. We are also entering that new normal now together. Um, and uh, let's go on that journey together. So when we talk about sustainable e-mobility, connected and digital aftermarket, the shared economy, and everything that's coming with that next generation of mobility, um, I think it's important to be prepared, learn, like Marco said, and uh, then we are looking into a bright future. Thank you so much. Perfect closing words. I want to thank, first of all, of course, uh, Dr. Holger Klein in Shanghai. Thank you so much for your time, for being a part of, uh, of our first topic here. And thank you to all of you, of course, also. Um, and now for the end, we have a statement from uh, Bill Russo, and he'll be talking about the perspective, what the mobility market looks like in China. So that should be very interesting. Have fun, and we will see you later. Thank you very much, especially to you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. Thank you. Thanks. Hello and all. Welcome from Shanghai. In uh, this session, we would like to give you some insights uh, in the automotive development here in ASEAN region, as well as in particular in China. Uh, doing so, I have invited uh, one of the leading industry experts um, for this area on the new mobility subject, Bill Russo. Warm welcome to Bill Russo. Thanks so much, Marcus. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for being here, Bill. Bill, with your Shanghai-based consulting company, uh, you're focusing on future mobility. At the same time, you're chairing the Automotive Committee at the American Chamber of Commerce here in Shanghai. Uh, we both shared some really good events and inspiring talks about the development of the auto industry in this region. So for me, it's really a personal uh, pleasure to have you with us today. It's my third year here in Shanghai. And uh, what I started to really love the first day 
is about this super convenient online payment. When I go out, um, there's just my mobile phone. Uh, there's no credit card, there's no wallet, there's no single RMB cash with me. And it works the entire day. Bill, it's 17 years for you in APAC region and many of these years you're here in China. What comes to your mind first when you think about that? Well, it, it, first and foremost, it, it, this has not been always a convenient place uh, in terms of you know foreigners and, and doing doing things here, both in terms of business as well as in terms of lifestyle. But uh, since the advent of the smart device, since the advent of the digital economy and the way it's made life convenient in terms of the, as you point out, the cashless society, I have not touched physical cash in nearly two years that I've been back uh, in, you know, since coming back after the uh, COVID outbreak began, uh, you know, the ability to, to live a lifestyle very much supported with digital services is something that's very different in China than the rest of the world. And, 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 and that, I think, has found its way into the way we live our lives. And mobility is part of our lifestyles. Every one of us is a mobile creature. And the ability to do things online and, and get their services uh, achieved with the app-based economy is something that's very unique and very powerful here in China. I really appreciate and um, uh, I can underline that. Uh, looking on my um, experience for mobility, uh, coming here to China, um, it, it changed my entire look into it. Um, I was used in my German life to have uh, two cars, uh, one for my family and one for me to commute to work. Uh, coming here to China, I simply open the app um, my, in my smartphone every day and check what's the best option. Sometimes um, this is a taxi cab, sometimes this is underground, um, sometimes this is even the next uh, rental bike uh, that is very close to me. Uh, and uh, whatever works best, uh, I choose for that. Um, taking it from here, uh, so could you give us um, a bit more of your insights? Um, what really is the trends that we can see here in, in the market when it comes to mobility? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, when I came over, uh, obviously, I was uh, an automotive industry person. I worked for Daimler Chrysler. I was head of the Chrysler business in Northeast Asia. Uh, the business of, of this industry was capturing the growth opportunity in the consumption of mobility through personally owned vehicles. Really, the most significant uh, ch uh, change uh, to the industry and, and to the business of mobility has been the advent of, of mobility as a service. Really 10 years ago, not originating in China, but globally becoming popular with the likes, likes of Uber and Lyft. Uh, but what's happened over the last decade is we've seen really a, a shift in power uh, toward more of, I, I would say the, 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 the internet companies uh, seeing mobility as the entry point for monetizing a relationship with uh, individuals who uh, consume uh, app-based services that involve mobility, not just personal mobility of us moving, but also the, the, the economy of movement of goods to us, right? Food delivery, uh, also very conveniently dispensed through uh, mobility apps, uh, through mobile phone-based uh, apps, uh, the e-commerce uh, players and their presence in the landscape. Uh, we have a, a shifting landscape of I, what I would say uh, breaking the moat of dominance of what has traditionally been a mechanical uh, engineered device, the mobility device, the automobile, into what's becoming a software-based and a, a digital consumption-based platform, which is the mobility uh, economy coming in and changing the nature of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the business of how we economize the utility that comes from the platform of the vehicle, which is mobility. Uh, I, I really can confirm that. Um, whatever you need here arrives within 30 minutes on your or on your door. Um, so mm -hmm. it's uh, it, it's once again uh, this um, uh, internet business that uh, really um, kicks in and in, in, in every part of the, the life. Uh, diving a bit, uh, diving a bit deeper into um, um, into the mobility section. Obviously, it's also about electrification. Uh, when people start talking with me about uh, 
this part of the new mobility. It's often focusing on less moving parts in uh, in the devices, uh, uh, no engine oil, less maintenance. However, that's only one aspect of the business. Could you elaborate um, uh, a bit also, if you see from your perspective, opportunities for growth or even for new businesses here? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, in part of what is freeing up the possibilities around mobility is, first of all, every human being on the planet uh, is a consumer of uh, some form of mobility, either their own personal movement or the movement of goods and services to them. Um, and in China, what happened, what really changed the way we, you know, the convenience of, of, of how we live our lives here is the smartphone became ubiquitous, right? We have in China, a, 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 a mobile internet population of nearly a billion people and virtually every, you know, I think there's 986 million internet users in China, 980 million of them consume services through smartphones. Uh, it's that scale, it's that scale of consumption that has changed the way we think about the economy of movement, right? It's, it's the, the, the traditional uh, automobile powered by an internal combustion engine now uh, being reprioritized to a device that consumes less energy, that consumes, uh, that provides more uh, productivity uh, in terms of the re revenue generating capacity of the machine, right? So the electric vehicle world is being ushered in by the, the companies that are, that are creating the economy around the services related to mobility. However, when you think about mobility as a service as businesses, those uh, companies are in the business of making money from the movement, not making money from the sale of the hardware, right? And it's the movement that generates uh, the opportunity for servicing the vehicle, right? The more a car moves, the more it requires maintenance, the more it, it requires uh, the, the, the monitoring of the performance of the machine so that we can ensure that it stays moving, right? It's the productivity of the device and service that drives even more consumption of replacement parts and in, 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 in service parts related to the aftermarket. But it's the economy of, of making the device productive and making it a revenue generating uh, device in service that is what I think the, 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 the tripwire for this revolution that we see happening around changing the economics for electric propulsion as well as self-driving vehicle technology. Thank you very much, Shaggy uh, Fuel. Um, well, despite all this um, internet thing, we see also just um, as a matter of um, um, subjects here, um, a lot of change in the industry as such. Um, and we see also lots of new players um, coming to the market and also uh, giving new products as well as new mobility devices. Could you give us a bit more insight on uh, what is your experience in, in this market and how the landscape is changing here in Asia and in China in particular? Right. I think a lot of people think about the sort of, sort of the most obvious thing that you see is, that happened in the last decade is the advent of uh, shared mobility and now the rise of electric vehicles in terms of mix of, 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 of solutions in play. In China today, you already have in July of this year, almost 15% of the sale of vehicles in China is now what they call new energy vehicles, which are battery electric or plug-in hybrid uh, type vehicles. So you've got a high penetration and growth uh, trajectory that's un, sort of incontrovertible. But when you really look at the landscape of players uh, in that space, you have to differ differentiate from companies that are just making EVs versus companies that are made, making what I call smart EVs, right? These are software defined vehicles. And I think that's you know, very important because the companies that make smart EVs are coming from the internet economy. They're companies like Neo, Xpeng, Li Auto, some of the new names that you see on the landscape. These are tech companies. These are companies that were funded by internet money, right? They were brought into existence from investments from the likes of Tencent, Alibaba, or, the, or companies like them. They see the car as a platform for services. They see a car as a platform to drive revenue after the sale. And it's this uh, freedom uh, from viewing themselves purely as manufacturing enterprises where they have to fill production capacity 
but they're really producing a device that could be monetized as a services platform. It's that degree of freedom that they have that allows them to think about the new technologies and how to commercialize them at the scale of the internet economy, not at the scale of how you fill a factory, but at the scale of how do you monetize a vehicle in a services ecosystem. That's what's really fundamentally different. And it's what creates, I think, the disruption that we keep talking about. It's new economies of scale to commercialize new technologies, leveraging the scale of the number of users that are that are monetized in a services-based ecosystem. Thanks a lot for these uh, really interesting insights. Uh, I love the conversation with you once again. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Marcus.